I'll walk very slowly through each slide so that you can understand, uh, hopefully, how to operate the, the, the spreadsheet, and then we'll do a demonstration at the end so you can see it by just manipulating a few, a few cells. Um, this, is a, this is a tool. It's not the tool, um, but it's been very helpful to me, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you. Um, so, Trev, you want to move to the next slide, please? So something that's really key for us to understand is how we can begin our process. Um, whether you're opening um, a, a restaurant or a butcher shop or just a manufacturing facility, you need to decide about what your vision is. Um, and I know this seems uh, like we're taking a few steps backwards. You, some of you have already decided to embark on this business. Uh, but it's important for you all to understand, again, that you need to continuously revisit that vision through the course of your business's life so that you can come back to it and make sure that you are moving in that direction. So if your vision was to open a whole animal butcher shop, then make sure that you are able to continue to afford the processing and the labor that's required in order to use whole animals exclusively. Um, so for my purposes, um, I operated a retail butcher shop that was with a restaurant, uh, with a 300-seat restaurant that it supported. And we had the ability to take some whole animals, some box beef, um, and utilize the yields over, those, um, over the processing of those animals to make salami, to make pâtés, to make hams, to make fresh cuts for the retail case, to make fresh sausages. Um, and then we also had to support the restaurant as well, too, for beef and for lamb and for pork um, and for poultry. Um, it was a, a very big endeavor, but because there was a sort of a corporate mandate in the way it was built, uh, we had a lot of financial reporting that was required. And uh, our owners were not chefs um, or, or they were not butchers. So it really required a lot of data for them to understand that when you get a 10-pound uh, animal, or let's just say a 10-pound uh, cut of meat, and you and your portion is eight ounces. That uh, you know they they're expecting 20 portions out of that piece of meat, uh, and that's just not the way it works. So we needed to make sure that we were capturing all this data in a way that made sense. Um, and so uh, over the, about three years, at this one particular place, along with another two or three years of this data that I've been collecting, we've been able to put this together. Um, so for for us, it was. Our vision was to, to make great added value product and to use whole animals to do it, uh, and specifically for pigs for this exercise. This map that you're looking at here in the overview is how we um, we took this from uh, University of Wisconsin. That was this is the ba basic anatomical breakdown, but we did not choose to break this way. We broke um, specifically for the kinds of end of the RTE products, the the final products that we were were going to use. Um, so I'll, um, Let's talk a little bit more about how we can define exactly how we want to build a program. Trevor, uh, next slide, please. So, answer uh, either uh, in, in, in the chat box or you can tell me. If you're dialing in, then you can talk. Um, we're launching a poll, but during our test session, some of the polls were not showing up on screen. So we're going to see if, if, if it launches, fantastic. If not, it may just turn your screen uh, just completely dark. But what kind of business are you running? Wholesale, retail, restaurant, CSA? Um, please, if, if it does not show up, please put your answers in the chat window. It's working, Trev, for me. Oh, fantastic. All right. We have about 63% uh, voting in. We'll give it a couple more uh, seconds and allow for everybody else to uh, vote in, see what we have, no responses in the chat window yet. We did have somebody raise their hand for a question. Uh, 
All right, just a couple more seconds and we'll close the poll and, and uh, look at the results. Aaron, you may proceed. Do you see the results on the screen? Yeah, wow. So mostly everybody here is in a retail is in a retail market. So this is this is super valuable. Um, you know, the restaurant and the CSA models are are slightly difficult uh, to manage actually. So this is this is fascinating. For the wholesale department, um, we can all understand that the the value of making sure that your product has a place and a purpose throughout uh, before it arrives uh, is pretty key. So if we move to um, if we begin to understand a little bit how this spreadsheet works, I think you guys will see how you can uh, you can really start to predict expense and really manage your business. And Trev, I'm I'm ready for the next slide. So if the products that you are going to make in your wholesale business are cooked, RTE, fresh, or shelf-stable, all of these, again, as they, as they pertain to your, your greater vision, have a, um, a yield. Um, and these items, whether they're fresh or not, you may not be, you may not be measuring those, those yields throughout the entire process. You may just be looking at uh, what your animal weighed when it came in, uh, how many pounds you started with, and what the market will bear. Um, that was certainly the way that I approached the, the conversation initially uh, when, I, when I started in this business uh, 15 years ago. But it's become clear to me that even though uh, I may have 70% shrinkage on a, on a piece of pancetta or I may be able to get a 90% yield on some fresh sausage or my cooked uh, tasso ham you know, has about 83% average yield, tracking that data and understanding how to use it gives me real power in how I uh, am able to charge for it. As a wholesale business, you're really in the pennies business. You're not really in the dollars. You're, you're not seeing that, that high retail cost necessarily. So you really have to make sure that every, every single scrap is, is accounted for. And through the tracking process, I've got some information that I think you know, can be helpful in how you guys evaluate the process. And Trev, let's move to the next one. All right, so for raw materials, we're going to do another poll here. Uh, who is using uh, whole parts, uh, whole animals versus, uh, versus uh, subprimals, uh, box products, or, or a combination thereof? We have about 50% voted in. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the poll, share the results. Okay, great. So uh, for those of you using just whole animal, uh, you have a huge challenge. Um, you, you can see that the animal, as it arrives, begins to lose weight um, immediately. Uh, and something that uh, we discussed um, as in, in the sort of lead up in this conversation, uh, which I'd like to keep as uh, continuing, is is the value of that product as a or the weight of that product as a hot carcass to a cold carcass to then when you receive it to then when you start to process it. There's a significant amount of loss there. And at what point do you, your vendor slash farmer slash uh, slaughterhouse agree to pay a price? Uh, at what point do you exchange money? Is it at the hot carcass weight, which is, would be more beneficial to the farmer? Is it at the cold carcass weight when it arrives at the door of your business, uh, which would be uh, beneficial to you because it weighs less, significantly less, uh, and you're paying for everything you get? Uh, or is it uh, some section in between there? Uh, if, you, if you evaluate that, that a, a refrigerator operates by drying the air before it cools it, 
you can see that there's a significant opportunity for loss unless those animals are processed that day, the day they arrive, or as quickly as possible. Um, if you decide to use a whole animal or parts, it doesn't really matter because you're still going to see uh, an evaporation. You're going to see purge through the process. If you cut up an entire pig or a hundred pigs and you put them into totes for one night before you process them, they will release more moisture into the bottom of that tote and you will, and, and that's unusable product now that you paid for, uh, that you will, <laughs> you will never see again. So you need to make sure you're accounting for that. Uh, now we've we've discovered that you know you can lose between one to two percent of that of that yield depending on the time of year, depending on the climate in which your business is operated. The business that we operated before was in Las Vegas, which has an extraordinarily dry uh, relative humidity in the air, somewhere between five and ten percent on average, uh, which which did a lot to 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 increase the loss. Um, and here in the Great Barrington, we see that that number has decreased slightly, about three quarters to one percent. But still, we're seeing that um, uh, we have to expect loss. Now, it's not important necessarily to uh, use the data before you have a finished product to, to use, but collecting it understands how you can now manage your your uh, your labor, and also ultimately how you can manage your pricing structure. So just to start here for number one, your usable product for primary and byproduct yield. You need to realize that if you be, if, as I'm sure that you all do, you buy a whole pig, how much of that pig is, is actually usable for the products that you're producing? I mean, as a primary use, for example, a belly, a skin on pancetta, okay, bone out, how much, what percentage of the animal is that? Uh, the whole ham for a prosciutto, skin on, foot on, uh, sirloin removed, uh, sacrum removed, H-bone partially removed or completely removed, uh, shoulder roll for a copa, uh, what point are you breaking? Uh, are you breaking between the second and the third? Are you breaking between the third and the fourth, the fourth and the fifth, or even the fifth and the sixth uh, if you don't sell a lot of rib chops? Uh, all of these decisions go into what first will cover the cost of this animal. And the byproduct that is left from that becomes a secondary use. All right, I'm taking the shoulders from the shoulder roll. I'm taking that collar muscle for my copa, but I'm left with the cushion. I'm left with the picnic, the skin on bone and picnic. All right, well, now I know I can take those hocks and I can smoke those and I can brine and smoke those and sell those by the pound. Uh, I can take those picnics and I can break those apart for sausage. Uh, I know those feet can be used for stock, for bone broth, or for, you know, a Japanese restaurant down the street that's making a lot of tonkotsu. Uh, you know, uh, all of these decisions that you're making need to be, uh, from, my, from my experience, were really helpful to break into three categories, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Stuff that I knew I could make first, that I could absorb the cost of the entire animal into without making it unreasonable to, to produce or to pay for. Uh, second products were uh, easy to sell, but that had a uh, I could make a higher margin, higher profit margin. And the tertiary was free money. For the example of those who process whole beef, bone broth. You've already paid for the bones. You've already paid for all the sinew. You've paid for connective tissue. The water and the electricity are your sunk costs into that process. Uh, by that I mean that it's just part of the, the basic operations of doing business. And so you're generating money from, from trash, right? The labor and time management goes into your understanding of the loss over the course of your entire process. The animal comes in on a Monday. Well, I don't have anybody to receive it on Monday because um, where I live, uh, people don't work on Monday. I'm making a hypothetical here. Tuesdays, they show up, they process the animal. Well, how much weight was lost overnight when the animal hung for one night, for 12 hours or for 24 hours? Then they break the animal down into, into, into sections, divided for their entire process, and then you can take that animal and they don't grind it and season it until the next day. So that's another day in a tote. Uh, you're losing more moisture, more purge is removing itself from this product, uh, and you lose another percentage point, perhaps. Then on the third day, you grind, you stuff, you may lose a quarter pound or perhaps a half a pound, depending on your batch size, to the grinder or to the to the stuffer, perhaps, 
uh, some waste that can't be some minuscule amount of waste, it seems minuscule, and then keeps increasing the price. So your final product where you have moisture loss over the course of your five scale, uh, your five log reduction, if you're doing drying shelves, shelf stable, or if you're brining where you're adding liquid back to the product and then smoking it, how much is the original different from the final product? All of these issues, when analyzed, give you the sense to say, no, 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 people need to work on Mondays. The animals need to be received and broken that day. Um, and then all the spices need to be prepared so that they can, they can grind first thing on Tuesday morning. It's all about being able to maximize your, your, your losses, right? If you can be efficient on how you, max, on how you control the amount of product that you lose, you can, you, can much, you can safely control the amount of money that you're able to make. Uh, and then marketable price structure, right? If you understand that this is the most efficient way of processing this product where it came in at $2 a pound on the rail, and now you've got a section of it that represents a real true cost because you've been able to track the loss from the beginning until you have a finished product, then you're able to offer the most uh, aggressive pricing structure to not, to not only distinguish your brands from everyone else, but also to be competitive. Uh, if you see that the general, uh, the other items on the market are not as good quality, but they have a lot more branding, well, you, and you know you're making a superior product, you are more control of your cost. You can say, well, listen, I can do it for a dollar less, and I know that I'm still going to be able to cover my costs. All right? Uh, it's not necessarily about being that aggressive, but it, it is to understand what you can afford to charge uh, and being able to cover your cost uh, for sure. Um, Trevor, let's move to the next, the next slide, please. Oh, I'd, I'd just like to add something really quick. Um, the concept of good, clean, and fair products is something borrowed from slow food. But the idea that we are buying the best quality product, we all want to start with the best quality product that's processed in the correct, in the, in the correct way, uh, at the correct and, and, super, and properly, um, <laughs> at a proper facility uh, with proper supervision and proper techniques so that we have the best product to work with. Um, I, I know that maybe just should go without saying, but it's important to mention, right? Food safety is a part of this, um, a fundamental part of this. All right. So, we begin at the beginning here. Let's assume that we have a we want to make um, Capicola, okay, as one of our main products, and we're going to use this as an example. We know that um, we're going to have some shrinkage. We know that it's a particular part that that's going to be our primary product, and we know we've been able to source a fantastic hog from a local farmer who is getting his product uh, slaughtered uh, humanely and 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 very thoughtfully at a fantastic slaughterhouse uh, 25 minutes away from his farm. Uh, you are 25 minutes away from the slaughterhouse, uh, and there's a clean and uh, safe transportation from that location to yours. You receive the product, and on the invoice, it says it's a 220-pound hog, uh, and you paid $3 a pound for it, uh, which means that your total cost, which you will never escape, is $660. That's your weight upon delivery. Uh, this is an important piece of information because you'll never change this number. It doesn't matter what happens in your process, you paid what you paid. So in this spreadsheet, you'll see a, little, a few checks, a few uh, formula checks which exist, just to make sure that everything is, uh, that we're still adding up to the same number. Okay, so um, this is your baseline for your, for your costing structure and your absolute yield. The second box here, explains that the yielding will change in every different form of processing. So whether you, uh, whether you make um, a smoked ham, a fresh sausage, a dry cured piece of meat, yes, there will be different yields. And there is the capability to adjust this spreadsheet to your specific needs. But this is you can even throw it away. It's just meant to be an understanding of how this process can, 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 can work. Um, it doesn't matter what you decide to make, though. You're going to lose weight from the beginning. And if, for example, you take a ham off of a hanging pig three days after you receive it, you have a loss of original weight, evaporation. Then you skin that ham and debone it. Again, more moisture on the table. You can't recuperate it. 
it will be slightly less than it was when you when you took it off the animal. Then you add liquid back to it, meaning a brine or perhaps you do a dry brine. What's important to consider is that whether it's a dry brine or an, uh, a whole brine uh, or a, a wet brine, you're replacing some of the material inside that ham with something else. And in the case of a dry brine, you're losing more moisture. So the cost continues to drop on the raw product and you're adding to the value of that product by putting more ingredients into it. You paid for that salt, you paid for the sugar, you paid for the bay leaf and the cinnamon and your pickling spices, or your brining spices. Well, now those are going into your ham. And the water that was in there is being replaced through osmosis with a saltier solution. So you're still paying for more product, right? You're, you're, I mean, you're still paying a higher price for that product um, every day. It, it's worth, it costs more to you every day that it's in process. So we see here on, in the step two area that we're understanding that the way that I'm evaluating this, and again, this is a customizable worksheet, I'm saying that 75 and a 75.6% of this animal is usable for protein. That's primary yield for me. Okay, I'm including all of that as my primary yield because I want to I want to be able to charge uh, an aggressive and competitive price. I don't want to evaluate the shoulders differently from the middle or the hind leg. This is what I've chosen to do. You can do it differently, but I'm using this example to say that of every 220 pounds I purchase, I only have 163.37 pounds of actually usable product. That's stuff that I can actually do something with. And it doesn't change the fact that I paid $660 for it. It means that for every pound of meat, it's worth more than $3. And that's the first, that's the opening argument here for this yield, is that this number is going to continue to rise through this process. Whether you make ready to cook, ready to eat, fresh, shelf stable, it doesn't matter. And then finally is the decision in, in the bottom here, this decision will then produce your total usable yield per animal and the average cost per pound for those items. So you're not, you're not necessarily starting by evaluating every piece that you take off, off of that animal, all that 75% of that animal, that 163 pounds. You're not necessarily building your recipe structure uh, at $3 a pound now, and you're using this $4 a pound because you know that there's still other part of that animal and you need to cover the cost of that 660. That's the point of this. A wise man once said to me that costing in a butcher shop for retail or wholesale means you have enough money to pay for the pig that you bought, you have enough money to pay for the next one you need, and enough to keep the lights on and the, and the, knife, and the, and the knife of the hand of the butcher. So, you know, you're talking about a very small margin here. So this gives you the ability to say, no matter what happens after this point, I have at least paid for this pig in its entirety. If you're in a retail business, or a restaurant business, um, I'm sorry, another retail, a wholesale business or a restaurant business, this is even more powerful because now you can use labor on top of this and, and do what is what Trevor refers to as a loaded, uh, a loaded yield um, where your labor is loaded into it and now you're certain that you're gonna cover your cost of operator plus product, plus raw material, okay? Let's move to the next slide, Trev. Just one moment, Aaron. We have uh, some questions coming in. Uh, Joseph sure. is asking, is the 75% based on your experience? It's based on my experience and the kind of product that I'm producing. Now, you can adjust it to whatever. This is not a, this is a generality. I'm using all of the fresh meat that's on there. I'm excluding bone from this equation, and I'm excluding fresh meat from this equation. Everything is for dry cured, uh, shelf-stable salami whole muscle cured product or smoked product. Um, there's no fresh cuts involved in that, in that analysis. Uh, and I could possibly have a bit higher yield uh, if I added a bone in pork chops or sold a, like a Danish bone in pork belly or skin on pork belly or skin on pork roast. You can customize it. And when you guys see the Excel spreadsheet, um, you'll see where you can make those adjustments. Uh, I'll, show, I'll walk you through how you can do that. And the second question, which you have partially answered, uh, are bones and skin included in that percentage? So at this point, what would you say how much skin is actually included in that? Very little. I would say very little. 
the idea is that I'm looking at actual usable protein. Skin and bone uh, and feet are not included in this list, and that's 75%. It's a purpose. It's a it's a, it's twofold. It's a safety net that prohibits that allows me the opportunity to say, well, if I want to put skin into my um, into my hot dogs, that's a product that I've already paid for. So it's no longer increasing my cost, uh, my recipe cost. Also, uh, alternatively, if I want to sell the pig skin as chicharrones or as um, you know uh, a pig skin terrine, or if I'm you know if I'm out in the Bay Area and I want to make pig skin pasta. You know, that product in that other dish is now uh, nothing, little to nothing uh, in cost. Uh, and so it's, it's a decision that you can make on the way that you cost out your recipes. But for right now, this is just protein. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. All right. So now the question becomes, how often do you yield test? Um, speaking personally, I do this. Uh, every time we break something. Um, so uh, over the last few years, I did it every batch, every single batch, every animal, uh, not necessarily because I was so excited about collecting data because it can be time consuming, but because um, I started this process because I had a corporate mandate that said, you got it. I want to know exactly what the value of your business is every day or we're going to close it. So it was a necessity, but I learned that there was actually the better I got at yielding, the better I got at cutting, or the better I got at portioning, or the better I was at managing my staff, the higher my yields were, uh, and the, the better my business was able to operate. Excellent. We're going to give this a few more seconds. We have about 44% sure. voted in. Reaching about 60% now. All right, we're going to go ahead and close this poll. Okay. So I've got a question for those. Um, how much? fluctuation for those who are yielding once a month do you see in your batch testing? Do you see a very large fluctuation? Do you see a very small fluctuation? What happens in your business over the course of that month? Are you changing vendors for product? Are you hiring or firing new uh, uh, employees? Is there training involved there? And for everyone in, that um, has the ability to enter questions in the chat window, I know some of some of those have called in from the car to listen on the road. Thank you for that. Uh, go, you can actually submit your answers in the chat window for us to review with Aaron. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say this to, to, to that effect. Um, yielding is something that is a pain in the ass, but it's like doing your taxes. Um, once you see the value of understanding how your taxes work, it becomes important to, to know that having that information is valuable. Uh, we see that whenever we have a new employee, we yield them first on chicken. Um, we don't bring them straight to a tenderloin or to a side of pork. Uh, when we break an animal, we make sure we show them the same way every time. Uh, when we hire a new employee, we, we work with yield testing on them and we weigh everything that they cut. Um, when we uh, when we have a new recipe that's being tested, obviously anything that goes into the production cycle that's new is going to have a different yield. Uh, it's going to have a new yield, and we're going to be able to put it up against the other products. For example, if I have a salami that I make with uh, fennel seed and chili flake, and I make a new salami that has garlic and uh, white wine, well, aside from the cost of the recipe, the there are two similar products in a field. And I can't assume that one will be the same exact yield as another. Even if the protein ratios are the same, meaning lean to fat is the same, 
meaning the size of the casing, uh, the size of the actual chub is the same. Uh, all of these, all of these processes to get to a cost per pound is what is going to give you the power to say the garlic one actually costs us 25 cents less a pound. Uh, we're actually able to get a little bit more because we're creating a slightly different bind at that blah, 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 blah. Whatever the reason is, if you don't do the batch, you leave anything up to assumption, that's exactly what it'll be. Uh, it'll be one thing where you think you're being able to recapture revenue and you may not be. Uh, you may be making more money than you want to, but if that's the case, then you're not accounting for it properly. Um, and you're not actually getting an accurate picture of how the business is doing. I know this sounds extremely, um, maybe uh, overdoing it a bit, but the value of your business is expense is significant, and it's an expensive business to be in with a very small margin. So, for me, from my perspective, this is a valuable piece of information, and I want to give it to you guys so you can use it. All right, so we're going to use the Capicola as uh, as our as our uh, primary product here in this expression. So we have a whole hog, all right? We take that shoulder off. Now for my purposes, I'll cut between the fourth and the fifth rib uh, for, that, for that yield. I want that copa to be that long. I'll cure the pork loin or sell it as shops in a different section. Um, I'll take the shoulder roll out of it. I'll trim it to what my spec is. And whatever is left in that shoulder, meaning the neck and spare ribs are already off, those are now in the trim pile, trim and bone. Uh, the skin is not part of the equation. That's gone. What's left in that shoulder is the paddle bone, uh, the humerus, the hawk, uh, and, the, um, and the foot, along with all the skin and fat and that's connected to it. Some glands, uh, the cheeks are taken off with the head. All right. So I've got all these other products that I can use for other things. Uh, I can take the hawks, like I said earlier, and I can smoke those. That'll be a secondary product. The meat from the picnic, I can remove and debone that area, and I can separate those and clean those pe those muscle groups, and I can have sausage meat, along with any any hard fat that's in there. Soft fat can be taken for pâtés and mousses. Uh, that'll be a tertiary product. The skin will be a tertiary product because I can do something with that skin. The bone can be what's considered waste. Uh, and I can use that for broth. I can also consider it a tertiary product if I wanted to assign some cost to it, but it's not value, it's not necessary. This puts my shoulder as saying that that shoulder represents about 35% of that animal, of that whole animal. That copa represents about 5% of that shoulder in weight. Uh, this is for a full, a full hog, so this is two shoulders, um, two copa rolls. And then the rest of that meat that's in there represents um, cost that I need to recapture. So do I want to charge $30 a pound for my copa so that my sausage meat is free? Or do I want to make that copa slightly less expensive by including that as part of the yield of the shoulder? Meaning I don't let that 5% stand alone. I make it that 36% or I include it with all of the other whole muscle cured products that I'll have from that animal, and that'll decrease, that'll uh, increase my total usable protein, meaning that I'm actually recapturing the cost if I use everything. And now I have the opportunity to make money uh, a little bit more aggressively and have a better cost of goods, a, um, a better cost of goods for that one particular product. Whereas if I had a, $16 copa it cost me 16 bucks a pound. Yeah, I got to charge 35, 40 bucks for it. But maybe that's not the kind of business I want to I want to work in, and maybe that's not the kind of demographic that I can sell to. Maybe I live in a small rural town where no one's going to pay 35 dollars a pound for anything. So I have to think about the way I cost my product in a way that makes it attractive to the people I'm going to sell it to. Ultimately, this is the point of this: is that we're all trying to make some money in this business, and good product on the tables of people in our community. So if we can do that, we can make it more affordable. So this is ultimately a, a huge part of this. Um, we see that there is purge and water evaporation that we're going to lose, but if you consider that you have, you have the ability to decide what is your baseline, uh, depending on what kind of products you want to use. So 
this is this is the fundamental concept here. If you have a vision of what your entire program can be, then you can decide how you want to break up those animals, whether it makes sense to buy whole animals or subprimals, and then you can yield accordingly. Uh, but you, if you consider that these rules apply no matter what you do, it's, it's, it makes it a powerful tool for your business. Let's go to the next slide, please. All right, just a moment to answer your previous question, Aaron, um, about uh, fluctuations in yield testing. Uh, we have a few people saying that there was not fluctu fluctuation with the same vendor and staff. Okay, that's great. That's great. So that, that means and that you're doing a great job at training. And uh, there's a question that came in. How do you determine what value to add to your byproducts? The general, the general rule is what would you pay to replace it uh, if I'm building a recipe out of it? So, for example, if I needed to buy pig skin, uh, what, what is my, what's the going rate for my, pig, for my pig skin? And so if my byproduct is um, if I have 10 pounds of pig skin in my, from breaking an entire, you know, a couple of pigs, uh, and I've got a vendor that's willing to sell me pig skin at $1.40 a pound, that'll be my placeholder. Uh, and that will allow me to uh, assign a value to it. That byproduct, though, let's not forget, if that byproduct isn't included, to go back to that 75% of usable product, it's paid for. You have absorbed the cost of that product in the, the stuff that you're making, uh, that, that you're using, that 75%. So it no longer has an actual value in your walk-in, but you do own it. <laughs> And it's part, it's paid for. So if you're going to sell it, you need to evaluate, first of all, what, what would it take if I needed to replace it, if I, uh, to start there? And then I can see that, all right, if I assign that cost to it, when I do my inventory, uh, I don't need to count that, uh, as that same, as that same cost. Because I've already paid for that product. It, it, it has no value. And you could be counting against yourself twice. The only reason it comes into account is if you're trying to sell it for a secondary, for another purpose, or you're building a recipe off of that product. You know, uh, there has to be an assumption that it has a cost to it, whether it's labor or not. The other option is you can go that way, and you can break down what your operators, how long it took them to process that animal. Let's say it took them an hour, 60 minutes. And 75% of their time was uh, of, of that breaking that animal revealed the rest of that uh, revealed the rest of the protein that's usable for a primary use, and 25% of that time was spent working on uh, was allotted to the, the value of that skin. It should be a minuscule amount of money. Call it 80 cents a pound, or um, 80 cents a pound, or 50 cents a pound. That is another good way, a good way to, to build that in. But again, it depends on what your final use is. If you're just throwing it away or you're denature, covering it with denature and, and sending it out the door, then it's not, it's, it's a lost cause. Uh, it's a lost cost. You've already absorbed it into your primary use products and you don't really need to worry about throwing it away because you're not losing any money. But you are leaving something on the table because you could make some money from that. Uh, you could, Oil it, grind it down, make skin block, freeze it, and use that in your hot dogs. In which case, you would take that and use the price of what it would take to replace it as your as your additional cost per pound for that product in your recipe. So, short short answer: market value is, is <laughs> your go to price price point. Thank right? you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> get a little into it all right so um, the cost of the raw material will grow uh, in in cost each and every moment we've sort of hammered this home but it's important to consider this again and again and again right so it's, it's a management tool along the along the way you process it but the final yielding against this will provide the same result so that being said is that if you paid uh, –
if you paid a uh, three dollars a pound for this animal, you know you get seventy five percent usable product. That copa then has a starting line of four dollars. Uh, then you lose another thirty percent in the in the process, uh, and you have to add ingredients to it. You get a final you get a final uh, price per pound. You're going to get to the same place if you just take the finished product and weigh it versus tracking it in each step. But I put this together so that you could track it because it's in the middle where you, you have to manage your people. Uh, the starting yield here is, is mentioned because there is water loss. Um, that's different from skin and bone being removed from the product. That's just the animal is just losing weight. Uh, I know that three pounds may seem like an excessive or four pounds seems like an excessive loss, but do yourself a favor and count it next time. Break an entire pig down in a day, put it into totes and pull it out the next day and weigh all the meat. Weigh all the bone, weigh all the skin. Or weigh a pig in your walk-in on a Monday and weigh a pig when you receive it and then weigh it on Wednesday and see what you lose. You're going to find it's a, it's a terribly surprising uh, uh, piece of information and it, it, can, be, it can be disappointing to, to discover that. Um, at certain Vegas, it was, it was huge. The compressors worked overtime to cool and to humidify those rooms. Uh, and let me tell you that there was a lot of loss, a lot of loss. All right, we can move to the next one, Trip. We've sort of hammered this home enough. There's a statement here, uh, not necessarily a question, but said uh, that they had put product into the uh, protein coolers for the cooks, and as the product uh, sat overnight, it wasn't properly wrapped, then they saw a fluctuation and it decreased in size. So if they cut it eight ounces, it was... Uh, almost down to seven and a half ounces by the next day. Sounds like a very uh, arid climate as well. Yeah, I've been in, and, and that's been a real interesting conversation to have with chefs, uh, is that they need to understand your process too. So, you know, it all goes back to management. Uh, to, this, is a, this, is a, this is a process of communication and making sure everyone's aware of how things work. Uh, I've been in that position too, where you, you cut an eight ounce uh, cut an eight ounce tenderloin for a chef or an eight ounce ribeye. The ten ounce ribeye the next morning, it, it, you lose an ounce. Now it's a, a nine ounce, and they're asking where the where it went, or they're saying that your yields are off, or they're saying that you're you're not accurately cutting the product, or that you're losing it, or that it's getting stolen. Even worse, uh, and yeah, it's an angel share. <laughs> it's just part of it. Um, in my experience, it's been make the chefs order what they need just for that day. And they should, uh, or make your wholesale clients understand that the longer it sits in the walk-in, the longer it has to go. The the the, the more you're going to pay for it. All right, so uh, we're getting um, we're we're almost finished here, guys. I don't want to go too far over two o'clock here, but uh, let's just assume that we've we've chosen a particular part of this animal. To, um, to utilize for certain processes, we understand that that 75.9% is 75.59% uh, is our usable pro protein, um, and we understand uh, that we can move through this. We can move through this uh, slide, Trev, because I think that we're we're going to get to the point here. We've already been talking about this. All right, so now let's talk about the copa here. We select the part of the animal that we want to use, and for this, we're using the copa. Based on our yields of breaking whole pigs, we see that, that those copas represent about 6% of the entire animal, okay, or 12, or about 13 pounds. Okay, this is from, a, this, is from this pig that was 220, that lost some, some air, some moisture to the, to, to the, evap to the evaporation of the room. Uh, and now we have a raw cost from the yielded cost, of, which, is, um, which is that 98% uh, of the total cost of $52. It's going to cost me a dollar twenty for ingredients to make these copas for the whole, not a pound in in total. Now these yellow numbers here are hard entries, so you can adjust these based on your recipe costs, which brings my total raw cost cost up to fifty three dollars and forty one cents. I'm going to lose thirty percent on that product, which brings my yielded cost to five seventy seven a pound. That is the that is the most important information there because this is where you determine what you can charge for it. Going back one column, this yield here, this is, this is an adjustable. 
So depending on when your product meets its five log reduction, it may not be at 70%. You, your water activity and your, your, uh, your pH drop may be significant at 76% or 77%. And we'll demonstrate that quickly to see how those affect this number here, this yielded raw cost. And then your MSRP is your, you know, that's your, that's your suggested retail price. That's a, these are assumptions here. These, these are made up numbers. But they can be specific to what you're char charging currently, and then that will, that will feed out your projected revenue for each piece. So let's move, let's move now to, um, to a demonstration, Trev. All right. And then we'll come back to some questions and answers. Yeah. And Aaron, you should have the screen. And while Aaron's going through this presentation, I'm going to release the materials for everybody to uh, be able to download if they have not yet been released. And uh, if you could go ahead and make your uh, screen full screen, Aaron. Okay. All right. So there's a color key here. Um, for training purposes, this is, becomes really helpful. Anything that's in pink is informational. Anything that's yellow is a hard entry, which means that you can adjust those numbers as you see fit. Pull data from other sheet is aqua or blue, whatever you want to call it. Uh, summation of other cells means I'm adding something up from another place. That's a green cell. An estimation just for calculations purposes is gray, and anything that's a formula check is orange with a red ink. These here are buttons that you can press and go directly to the next spreadsheet so that if you go back and you don't remember what a color means or something, you can just hit the color code and, and go back. I just want to make a couple of adjustments here on this spreadsheet or just a couple of examples of how you can manipulate pricing and manipulate costing so that you can see the value of it. I'm happy to answer any questions offline, but just so that you guys know what you're looking at. All right, so I've got some product here that's hidden. So you can see how we, uh, how we walk through it. This is my, this is my yielding. And this has come from many years of processing, right? Many, many, many different hundreds of pigs. We've been able to get this average information, which you can use. The weight here is 220. It could easily be 200. And the price could be a dollar. All the numbers change. And we're looking at the estimated value and a cost of goods. The idea is that I can move through this and I can select the parts of the animal that I'm going to use. Let's say I'm just using the copa. The flaps and the cushion and the pork and all these other pits, have, they're, they're, not, they're not part of it. So I'll move here to the added value production, which is the second part of this. And I see that there's my weight. There's my approximate purge. Here's my purchase price per pound. That's what I paid for it. That's not going to change. I see that my starting yield cost is based off of this number here in, in B19 being, being an increase from the 200, uh, from the, from the dollar because I only have 98% usable product because I lost some to the, to the walk-in. For what I'm selecting, I'm pulling product. I'm saying that I'm using all protein from the shoulder all usable protein from the middle, and all usable protein from the ham. But for this experience, I'm just calling it the ham, the long ham. That means that the sacrum is removed, the H-bone is removed, but the foot and the skin are still attached onto it. The, the femur is still on there, and the, shin is, the shank is still, is still attached. Because I can easily pull this apart, and I can use the bottom round and the eye round as the spec, I can remove the, the inside peeled, the top round for, um, for another, for sausage or for a baby, you know, like a little small ham. I can use the lean for salami. I can use the 50-50 for another kind of fresh sausage. But I'm choosing just to select this 24.61%, which is all these little pieces added together plus a little bit. 
okay? Um, that means my total usable poundage is 148.52. I'm back to B23. And now I've got uh, the total projected revenue per carcass, right? That's just based off of how much money I think I could make, okay, by taking the projected revenue from this, these columns over here. Now, if I want to adjust the pricing, let's just say that my yield on my COPA, for our example, is actually, uh, you know, let's just say it's 78%. Well, my yield of raw cost now is $1.73, and my MSRP of 13% cost of goods on this product is pretty ridiculous. If I charge six, I'm doing all right. And now I can take this information, and I can move over here to the expected cost. And now I can see the, the entire picture for how my product is being used. And down at the bottom here, I'll see that I'm using three pigs a week, total investment, right, $200 per pig, $600 in, in investment per week, all the ingredients that are added up to produce those products, my total cost of finished product, that's a weekly price there, $1,300 and my total projected revenue per week if I sell all that product at the value that, I'm being, that it's being sold at. I've selected these products here, prosciutto, dry cured salami, bacon, and lonza as the items that I'm gonna use for my pig processing. I know that I'm processing uh, 432 pounds a week of product with you know, almost $15 worth of um, worth of ingredients for a total projected cost of $1,300. Now, here's something to consider, guys. The cost of my finished product here. All right. If I can go back for a minute to our initial conversation, at one dollar um, one dollar a pound here, the cost of my finished product is less than my total raw investment. So that's, that's important to understand, right? It's gonna cost me less than all of those, that becomes a portion of that product, of that total value. And so now I can put that into my total cost per month and then per year. Then I can look at my total projected revenue per week, per month, and my revenue per year. But something that's important to consider for this is that this revenue for, for uh, is only going to be receivable after your product has reached maturity. So if you develop a spreadsheet where you can look at the cost over the course of a year, you know, a basic P&L, you know, uh, with just top line expenses and, and top line revenue, you'll be able to see that, you know, for 15 months, for the first year of making prosciutto, that product is not, is only costing you money. It's costing you about $7,000 a year uh, to, to produce. And you won't see anything until the third, the, until after the first quarter of the second year. So that's something to consider when you analyze your actual value that you can expect. Um, you guys are, are going to get a copy of this spreadsheet, and you can fuss with it as much as you like. Uh, you can turn it into your own your own process if you like. But I'm I'm happy to answer any questions or walk you through it if, if you need me. Um, that's it for me, Trev. Excellent. Well, we have lots of great questions coming in. Some of them are. Uh, um, very similar, so I'm going to go ahead and read two. Uh, for those of us not currently breaking pork, how, how challenging would it be to incorporate other animals? Um, and then there's a second portion to that question. James says, most of the spreadsheet appears to be directed at whole animal purchasing. How do I use the spreadsheet if I'm only buying subprimals? Okay. Well, uh, let's go to the first question first. Um, so uh, the first question was uh, about incorporating whole, incorporating more animals into your production, whole animals into your production. Is that right, Trev? And not just um, whole animals, but just other species. Okay. Um, you can you can easily take this information um, and use it as a template for yielding beef uh, or yielding lamb. The anatomical structure is, is relatively the same. Um, obviously, you're going to get more pieces from each section. 
Um, I do have a beef chart, which I'd be happy to share with anybody, but it's it's very similar to this, um, and uh, it's not you know, it's not something I'm going to go through uh, today. But um, the fundamental prospect is to consider bring in a beef, um, and if you can, if you have a plan to use a beef cleanly, see un understand how much more labor is associated with processing that beef, and then what are you going to do with it? Uh, do you have a venue to move that product? Um, do you, is it included in your HACCP plan if you have one or required to have one to process beef in your facility? Um, do you know where all the products are going to go? Do you have a pot large enough to process all of the uh, all of the bone broth or to make uh, to make stock? The, the, to answer your question shortly, go back to your vision and adjust it to fit what you want to do. So if you now want to include beef in it, well now what's your dream? What's your dream in including beef or another species into this process? And then break it down from there. So the second question, you can use the understanding of what your animals, um, what your primals are, are how they're coming and who is cutting them. If you're getting primals from a, a standard uh, packer who's using uh, who's using the NAM guidelines to break pork, you're going to see shoulders that are much smaller. You're going to see hams that are broken through the H bone. So the yields are going to be adjusted. Um, but you can easily use this model if, um, as a way to understand how the cost will increase. But now instead of having skin and bone, if you're buying, let's say, boneless shoulders, now you've got the plastic and you've got the purge in the bag. And now those are your yield. Those are the costs that are going to start to uh, those are the, the factors that are going to start to increase the cost of your raw material. Uh, this template is used for whole animals because that's primarily what we've been doing. But you can easily see that if you're able to get 5% of an animal or 4% of an animal, which should be a shoulder, then you have an expectation of what that raw cost should be. So when you speak to your producer or your vendor, you could say, look, you're charging me $5 a pound for these, for these pork shoulders. Walk me through it. How's that, how's that, how are you getting to that number? You know, and if you live in a place where you buy from Cisco or you buy from U.S. Foods or you buy from a large producer, work with them and say, look, you know, I can't afford shoulders because I want to sell at this price, but I do want to buy whole bone and shoulders. Can you work with me on that? You know, it's all based off of what you want to make, how much you want to sell it for. And hopefully there's data in here that will allow you to, to predict how much money you should expect to spend and how much money you should expect to make from a particular product. Because whether you buy whole cured mussels, whole pigs, or whole subprimals, it doesn't matter. 70% is going to be your drop in moisture, give or take a few points, for a cured piece of copa. A prosciutto should be 60% of its original weight. You know, those things aren't going to change whether you buy whole animals or pieces. The speed at which it happens, sure, maybe that's affected, but those things don't change. So you can predict a lot of costs whether you use whole animal or, or pieces. So do you think it would be beneficial to taking the uh, weight and cost of the subprimal and using that as your entry data at the top of the spreadsheet and then changing each line to fit the production at that particular facility? Yeah, that would be a good way to do it. All right, we have another question here. Does this model contemplate the cost associated with finished product uh, packaging and or transportation? No, it doesn't. It but doesn't we, you were talking about doing another, um, almost like a part two or another series of these where we just kind of, we were diving deeper into the business of Shakuri. Can I have the screen for a sec, Trev? Absolutely. I know it's I know it's past two o'clock, guys. I'll, I'll 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 be brief here. Uh, ha, have I got the screen? Yes, sir. It's yours. You just have to explain. All right. So I've I've included a P and L here. A you you have Sorry. to accept the the request. Um, how do I, how do I do that? Make sure. Click on your your uh, go to training tab, and it should pop oh, up. Oh, here we go. Got it. Yep, show my screen. Okay. So I've included a sample PL here. 
which will give you these numbers are pulling these are um, these numbers are can be entered uh, any way that you want but this just gives you a sample here you can you can you can pull this template together this would give you a net operating income at the bottom based off of your production and you can link the data from your from whatever production you decide to produce whatever whatever product you decide to make this number down here at the bottom your total projected revenue per year okay in cell L46 can easily be connected to this top line here for annual gross revenue and you can fill in here what your cost of goods is you can fill in your percentage there if you like or you can add a real number from this previous spreadsheet comps about 1% that samples giving away to people uh, you've got tastings coming up you've got new clients you want to work with a third-party distributor you got to give them some pieces and sell them on it then you've got your scheduled labor there's also a schedule in here guys where you can uh, you can adjust the the time in and time out to add up here at the end for your total labor dollars per week plus labor plus tax which we have at 18 percent uh, you can adjust that to your local tax rate and then labor per year okay then if you have a program that has weekly or daily sales you can adjust these numbers as you like this can be 11,000 here and you have 35 percent labor cost these are budgetary numbers they're not exact there may be some somebody comes in late or someone does this this is not uh, uh, this is not something that works that you give to your employees this is something for you where at the beginning of the week you budget how much labor you expect to spend or at the beginning of the quarter or at the beginning of the year and you can predict based off your production cycle here I've got one person making charcuterie one person making sandwich san uh, sausages one making sandwich and one shop manager but the cells are hidden here between 17 and 30 so there's lots more opportunities to add new new employees and then that number can go right here in labor per year so this is not this and then you've got employee taxes and benefits at, at sorry at 18 percent uh, you've got direct operating expenses this are based off of percentage of sales so these are industry standards here but that's why they're there uh, you, you can enter real numbers into this but it's just a template and so you can actually see what you should be expecting to, to generate over the course of a year or a week or a month and then build your build your updates based off of that any other questions guys well that that wraps us up for time um, but w how can people get in touch with you to um, edit this themselves or if they get kind of lost in a formula yeah, my uh, my email is on the final page of this uh, pres 